Hey guys, we're finishing up Acts today. We're in Acts chapter 27 and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, may your blessings of love and peace and happiness be upon everyone who watches these videos and please help us understand the wisdom and knowledge that we retain today, Lord. And Lord, please touch the hearts of every single person that hears your word, Lord. Please pull on their heart strings, Lord. And save them. Do what you do best, Lord. We love you so much. We give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. Because Jesus, you are so more than worthy. And you love us so much that you came down here, lived here for 30 some odd years as a human, and then chose to die for us, Lord. That is love. You are love, and we thank you so much for your love, Lord. We love you, and thank you, and we pray and ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, I found another I hear his whisper, and I love it so much, so I'm going to read it first. Okay, so it's written by Brian Simmons and Gretchen Rodriguez. I hear his whisper, my cleansing love will wash over you. And then pretend that Jesus is speaking this. I am cleansing you over and over and over. I am washing you in my love and soaking you in my grace. It's true that you are already clean, for my word lives in you and brings forth fruit. But did I not wash my beloved disciples' feet? In like manner, I will wash the filth from your feet until every place you stand becomes holy. Many times your thoughts need my cleansing fire to destroy the lies that seek to lodge in your heart. I will cleanse your thoughts until you are fixed on nothing but the ways of holiness and purity. I set you apart to be fully mine. And what is it that makes you fully mine? A surrendered heart and a mind that carries my thoughts and love to others. <clears throat> and then... Be wise and alert to the greatest deception of all, self-deception. We are our own worst critics, you know. I will continue to sift your motives until your conscience is clean before my glory. <clears throat> I desire purity, not only outwardly, but with every activity and motive. Whatever you speak, speak it as the living truth of God. Whatever you do... Do it as unto me, then watch as my cleansing love washes over you. I love these things so much. Okay. Okay, Acts chapter 27 in the Passion Translation. Paul sails to Italy. Okay, when it was decided that we, probably Luke, okay, when it was decided that we, so Luke and Paul, were to sail for Italy, Festus handed over Paul and a number of other prisoners to the custody of a Roman officer named Julius, a member of the Imperial Guard. We went on board a ship from the port of Adramitium. Adramitium, Adramitium, modern day Adrimit, Turkey. <clears throat> okay, so we went on board a ship from the port of Adramitium that was planning to stop at various ports along the coast of southwestern Turkey. We put out to sea and were accompanied by Aristarchus from Thessalonica in Macedonia. The next day we docked at Sidon and Julius, B 
being considerate of Paul, allowed him to disembark and be refreshed by his friends living there. From there, we put out to sea, but because the winds were against us, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus. Cyprus is an island in the, the northeast side of the Mediterranean. Oh, but they sailed on the east and north side of the island. Okay. After sailing across the open sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we docked at the port of Myra and Lycia. While we were there, the commanding officer found an Egyptian ship from Alexandria that was bound for Italy, and he put us on board. We made little headway for several days, and with difficulty we made it to Cnidus or Sinaitis. Turkey. The strong winds kept us from holding our course, so from there we sailed along the Lee of Crete, opposite Cape Salome. Hugging the coast, we struggled on to a place called Fair Havens near the town of Lycia. We remained there a long time until we passed the day of the Jewish fast. Paul advised the frightened sailors that they should not put out to sea in such dangerous weather, saying, Men, I can see that our voyage would be disastrous for us and bring great loss, not only to our ship and cargo, but also to our own lives. We should remain here. But the officer in charge was persuaded more by the ship's helmsman and captain than he was by Paul. So the majority decided to put out to sea since Fairhaven was an exposed harbor and not suitable to winter in. They had hoped to somehow reach the Cretan port of Phoenicia. Or Phoenix, which was a more suitable port because it was facing south. When a gentle south breeze began to blow, can you believe that there's this much weather in the Mediterranean, even though it's like surrounded by land everywhere? Okay, when a gentle south breeze began to blow, they assumed they could make it, so they pulled up anchor and sailed close to Crete. But it wasn't long before the weather abruptly worsened and a storm of hurricane force called the Nor'easter. Okay, those are only in the Northeast Atlantic. Okay, so, but it wasn't long before the weather abruptly worsened and a storm of hurricane force called Euroclidon's Typhoon tore across the island and blew us out to sea. That sounds better. The sailors weren't able to turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it be driven by the gale winds. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Kada, we were barely able to get the ship's lifeboat under control, so the crew hoisted the dinghy aboard. The sailors used ropes and cables to undergird the ship, fearing they would run aground on the shoals of Sirtis. <clears throat> Or Sirtis, Sirtis. They lowered the drag anchor to slow its speed and let the ship be driven along. The next day, because of being battered severely by the storm, the sailors jettisoned the cargo, and by the third day, they even threw the ship's tackle and rigging overboard. Okay, so they're like, uh, we're going to die pretty much, and we have to get rid of all this stuff on the ship. So, and they were seriously scared for their lives. And then the coolest thing happens. Okay. Okay, so they're throwing all their stuff overboard. They're trying to slow down the ship. They're trying to lighten the boat. After many days of seeing neither the sun nor the stars, and with the violent storm continuing to rage against us, all hope of ever getting through it alive was abandoned. After being without food for a long time, 
I think it was like 14 days too, maybe. Not sure. Okay, so after being without food for a long time, Paul stepped before them all and said, Men, you should have obeyed me and avoided all this pain and suffering by not leaving Crete. Now listen to me. Don't be depressed, for no one will perish. Only the ship will be lost. For God's angel visited me last night, the angel of my God, the God I passionately serve. He came and stood in front of me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul. You are destined to stand trial before Caesar, and because of God's favor on you, he has given you the lives of everyone who is sailing with you. So men, keep up your courage. I know that God will protect you just as he told me he would, but we must run aground on some island to be saved. Okay, so... A while ago, I wrote a poem, and it was about staying in the Lord's ship, and it was about this scenario. Like, so no matter how bad the storms are crashing around you, no, no matter how bad you think life, or you feel life is eating at you, and you feel that there's no way out, Instead of abandoning ship, stay in the ship of the Lord, sing from the rafters, sing from the top of the masts, because you will be protected, because you are staying in the ship of the Lord. So sometimes when I'm going through hard times, I seriously imagine my ship, or imagine myself on a ship, the ship of the Lord, singing from the top of the masts praises to the Lord, even though the hurricanes and winds and seas and storms are crashing all around me, everything will be okay because I'm staying in the ship of the Lord. I really love this chapter. Okay. <clears throat> so, God's going to protect them all. All they have to do is stay in the ship. The ship will not be saved, but every single human will be. So Paul just told them that. On the 14th night of being tossed about the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors sensed we were approaching land. So they took soundings and discovered that the water was about 120 feet deep. After sailing a short distance, they again took soundings and found it was only 90 feet deep. Fearing we would be dashed against a rocky coast, they dropped four anchors from the stern and waited for morning to come. Some sailors pretended to go down to drop anchors from the bow when in fact they wanted to lower the lifeboat into the sea and escape, abandoning ship. Paul said to the Roman officer and his soldiers, unless you all stay together on board the ship, you have no chance of surviving. At the moment they heard this, the soldiers cut the ropes of the dinghy and let it fall away. See, if you trust the Lord, everything will be okay. Oh, gosh. <clears throat> okay. Just before daybreak. I'm more so talking to myself than anyone else. If I trust the Lord, I will be okay. <clears throat> okay, just before daybreak, Paul urged everyone to eat. He said, Today makes two full weeks that you've been in fearful peril and hunger, unable to eat a thing. Now eat and be nourished, for you'll all come through this ordeal without a scratch or not one hair of your heads will perish. Then Paul took bread and gave thanks to God in front of them, broke it, and began to eat. There were 276 people who ate until they were filled and were strengthened and encouraged. After they were satisfied, they threw the grain into the sea to lighten the ship. Paul is shipwrecked. 
When daylight came, the sailors didn't recognize the land, but they noticed a cove with a sandy beach, so, so they decided to run the ship ashore. They cut away the anchors, leaving them in the sea, untied the ropes holding the rudders, and hoisted the foresail to the breeze to head for the beach. But they drifted into the rocky shoals between two depths of the sea, causing the ship to flounder still a distance from shore. The bow was stuck fast, jammed on the rocks, while the stern was being smashed by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers wanted to kill all the prisoners to prevent them from escaping, but the Roman officer was determined to bring Paul safely through, so he foiled their attempts. He commanded the prisoners and crew who could swim to jump overboard and swim to shore. The rest all managed to survive by clinging to planks and broken pieces of the ship so that everyone scrambled to the shore uninjured. Don't you just love that? I just love it so much. I just love it. Okay, chapter 28. This is the end of Acts. Okay. Paul on the island of Malta. After we had safely reached land, we discovered that the island we were on was Malta. The people who lived there showed us extraordinary kindness, for they, welcome us, they welcomed us around the fire they had built because it was cold and rainy. When Paul had gathered an arm full of brushwood and was setting it on the fire, this is a cool part too. A venomous snake was driven out by the heat and latched onto Paul's hand with its fangs. When the islanders saw the snake dangling from Paul's hand, they said to one another, no doubt about it, this guy is a murderer. Even though he escaped death at sea, justice has now caught up with him. But Paul shook the snake off, flung it into the fire, and suffered no harm at all. That's the Lord we serve. Not only saving everyone from the ships, but also a venomous snake. <laughs> or, I mean, the storms. Okay. Everyone watched him, expecting him to swell up or suddenly drop dead. After observing him for a long time and seeing that nothing unusual happened, they changed their minds and said, he must be a god. The Roman governor of the island named Publius had his estate nearby. He graciously welcomed us as his house guests and showed us hospitality for the three days that we stayed with him. His father lay sick in bed, suffering from fits of high fever and dysentery. So Paul went into his room and after praying, placed his hands on him. He was instantly healed. When the people of the island heard about this miracle, they brought all the sick to Paul and they were also healed. The islanders honored us greatly. And when we were preparing to set sail again, they gave us all the supplies we needed for our journey. Okay, wait, 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 wait. I just wanna see where Malta is real quick. Oh, what? How'd they get all the way from Turkey to basically the south of Italy? Is that how far they traveled in those 14 days? That's crazy. Okay. Okay, so, <clears throat> Paul reaches Rome, verse 11. After three months, we put out to sea on an Egyptian ship from Alexandria that had wintered at the island. The ship had carved on its prow, as its emblem, the heavenly twins. These were the twin sons of Zeus, Castor, and Pollux. The Aramaic is... Oh, okay, so its emblem was flying the flag of Gemini. 
So this was a, a widespread cult in Egypt in that era. Okay. So that was on the ship. When we landed at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. From there, we set sail for the Italian city of Regium. The day after we landed, a south wind sprang up that enabled us to reach Puteoli. This was on the west coast of Italy. Okay, so we reached Putu Puteoli in two days. There we found some believers who begged us to stay with them for a week. Afterward, we made our way to Rome. When the believers were alerted we were coming, they came out to meet us at the Forum of Appius while we were still a great distance from Rome. Another group met us at the Three Taverns, which was about 33 miles from Rome. So already, so in a matter of Okay, when was Acts written? So the good news of the Lord had already reached Italy in a matter of now I guess it's been some years. Okay, never mind. Okay, when Paul saw the believers, his heart was greatly encouraged and he thanked God. When we finally entered Rome, Paul was turned over to the authorities and was allowed to live where he pleased with one soldier assigned to guard him. Paul speaks to prominent Jews of Rome. After three days, Paul called together all the prominent members of the Jewish community of Rome. When they had all assembled, Paul said to them, my fellow Jews, while I was in Jerusalem, I was handed over as a prisoner of the Romans for prosecution, even though I had done nothing against any of our people or our Jewish customs. And she's loud. Like she gets louder and louder every day. Okay. So, <clears throat> all right. So Paul came together with all the Jews and he said the, of the Jewish community of Rome, my fellow Jews, while I was in Jerusalem, I was handed over as a prisoner of the Romans for prosecution, even though I had done nothing against any of our people or our Jewish customs. After hearing my case, the Roman authorities wanted to release me since they found nothing that deserved a death sentence. When the Jews objected to this, I felt it necessary, with no malice against them, to appeal to Caesar. This, then, is the reason I have asked to speak with you, so that I could explain these things. It is only because I believe in the hope of Israel that I am in chains before you. They replied, We haven't received any letters from the Jews of Judea, nor has anyone come to us with a bad report about you. But we are anxious to hear your present to hear you present your views regarding this Christian sect we've been hearing about, for people everywhere are speaking against it. So they, I bet Paul was like, oh yeah, it's time for me to preach. Okay, so they set a time to meet with Paul. On that day, an even greater crowd gathered where he was staying. From morning until evening, Paul taught them, opening up the truths of God's kingdom. With convincing arguments from both the law and the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. That is, about the purpose of Jesus' coming, which would include his life, ministry, death for our sins, and glorious resurrection. Some were converted, but others refused to believe. They argued back and forth, still unable to agree among themselves. They were about to leave when Paul made one last statement to them. This is what he said. The Holy Spirit stated it well when he spoke to your ancestors through the prophet Isaiah. And this is it. I send you to this people to say to them, you will keep learning, but not understanding. You will keep staring at truth, but not perceiving it. 
for your hearts are hard and insensitive to me. You must be hard of hearing, for you've closed your eyes so that you won't be troubled by the truth, and you've covered your ears so that you won't have to listen and be pierced by what I say. For then you would have to respond and repent so that I could heal your hearts. And that was Isaiah 6, 9 through 10. Okay, so then Paul says, so listen well. This wonderful salvation given by God is now being presented <clears throat> to the non-Jewish na nations and they will believe and receive it. Paul lived two more years in Rome in his own rented quarters, welcoming all who came to visit. He continued to proclaim to all the truths of God's kingdom, Rome, teaching them about the Lord Jesus, the anointed one, speaking triumphantly and without any restriction. Okay, that's the end of Acts. Let's pray. Jesus, Lord... Thank you for ushering in a new age of humanity when you came down here, Lord. Thank you that, thank you for giving us access, all of us access to you, not just the Jews, but all of us Gentiles as well, Lord. Thank you for letting the whole world be your children. And Lord, please protect and help and comfort those 17 missionaries in Haiti, Lord. Please strengthen them, Lord. Please keep them safe. Thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. Thank you that the prayers of the righteous don't go on deaf ears, Lord. Thank you for hearing us. Lord, we trust you. We believe in you. We love you, Jesus. And we thank you and we pray and ask these things in your name, Lord Jesus. So be it. Okay, God bless. I love you guys.